Amen. All right, you're there in Romans chapter 5. Now, many of you were here when we preached through Romans 5, and I love Romans 5 because it actually talks about a gift more than any other chapter. And salvation is a gift, and there are many people that do not understand that. And over the next couple weeks, we're going to look at some soul winning sermons. We're going to look at some things to help you to become a better soul winner, to get sharper in preaching the gospel. And the title of the sermon tonight is How to Get a Calvinist Saved. Amen. How to Get a Calvinist Saved. Now, a lot of people aren't even sure what Calvinism is. I preached a sermon over a year ago titled uh, John Calvin the Reprobate. And I showed how that John Calvin was unsaved and he was a heretic and he changed the gospel and he perverted the simplicity that should be in the gospel. John Calvin was a Catholic, essentially. He was trying to reform the Catholic Church we're not trying to reform the Catholic Church. We're not reformers. We're not Protestants. We're not Calvinists, and we're not Arminianists. Okay? Right. And usually Calvinists like to argue. When you come to the door and you're preaching the gospel and you find somebody that is slightly a Calvinist, there's, there's probably an opportunity to help them see the truth and help them get saved. But those that are leaders in the Calvinist movement are totally unsaved. They're heretics. They are false prophets preaching a false gospel. They've, they've changed the simplicity that's in the Word of God. And they try to make it this, this really heady, high-minded, super-educated, and they're going to use a bunch of terminology that you're never going to find in the Bible to make it complicated. And they laugh at you and they scoff at you when you just simply say you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's very important we understand where they're coming from. Like I said, most of your Calvinists, they're basically followers of John Calvin. And like I said, John Calvin came out of the Catholic Church he was trying to reform the Catholic Church. And what he taught, or what his doctrines that were then created into a system, they call TULIP. All right, now we have, I don't have one of the flyers with me, we have flyers in the back that line out what TULIP stands for. And it also, you can download it, it's on our website, steadfastjacksonville.com slash tulip.jpg. And that's all lowercase. You can pull it up on your phone, you can share it on Facebook, you can email it to people. And it goes through each of their doctrines and it gives you a definition of how they define it and then the scriptures that clearly debunk it. And like I said, if you come across somebody that's an adamant Calvinist, you probably need to walk away. You probably just need to knock the dust off your shoes, go on down the road, find somebody that wants to hear the gospel, find somebody that's humble enough to admit they don't know everything and that they want to know what God teaches. And there are people that are in Calvinist churches that can be saved. There may even be people in Calvinist churches that are already saved and they just have some bad doctrine that's been added to them. They may not even realize that their church is teaching Calvinism because they don't recognize the keywords. A lot of those keywords you'll hear are like doctrines of grace, the sovereignty of God. And what, hey, God is sovereign, yes, but that doesn't mean God makes my decisions for me. God has commanded me to believe on Him. God has commanded me to repent and believe the gospel. And this is very important to understand. Otherwise, you, you just have, you sort of take the responsibility off of yourself. Now, and they have this straw man. They want to say anybody that disagrees with them on Calvinism must believe in Arminianism. And listen, Calvinism and Arminianism both teach you can lose your salvation. Yeah. And most Calvinists would say, well, that's not true. We believe in the perseverance of the saints, and we're going to get into that. But both, both sides would teach a false gospel. So if you know some, oh, you're an army. No, I'm not. I'm a Christian. I'm a Bible-believing, born-again Baptist. I'm a Christian. And I'm not, I'm not going to follow John Calvin or any other man. I'm going to follow, follow what Jesus Christ said. Amen. To understand, you know, there's, there's a lot of Southern Baptists that have this internal struggle right now. And it is an Arminianism, which is clearly a work salvation. Arminian, they're, they're eager to say, well, you can't just pray a prayer and believe on Jesus. You have to do the works. You have to repent of all your sins. So this is why half of the Southern Baptists would say you have to turn from sin to be saved. The other half are Calvinists, and they believe the same thing in a different way. They believe what John Calvin taught, that God picked you to be saved. He picked everybody else to go to hell. And you know they say that Jesus only died for a select few. They teach that Jesus did not die for the entire world. He didn't die for the sins of everyone. They teach that Jesus chose who He died for and just died for them. Everyone else, there is no hope. Basically, God created them to burn forever. And that's a very strange, perverted view of God 
Because Calvinists also have this hands-off mentality. Right. And it's funny because, you know, those that would try to defend Calvinism, they would take the extreme sides of it. Oh, well, that's hyper-Calvinism. You know, this in the same way the dispensationalisms are they're so deluded in dispensationalism. Yeah. You know, the, the Calvinists do the same thing. Where there's a group of them that would teach, well, why would we evangelize? God picks. In fact, if you get in between that, that process, you're going to step on God's toes. You're going to be outside of God's will. Many of your Calvinist leaders taught you shouldn't have missionaries. You shouldn't preach the gospel. Right? What Jesus said doesn't apply to you. And it's a very strange way that they come to this, but it's like, well, God picks, so why would you even bother opening your mouth? And Calvinism really, like I said, it perverts the, the gospel. They teach, they're instructing what they call the doctrines of grace. This is key, terminology. Somebody that's always thrown around the word grace is usually a red flag for me. Okay? I believe in the grace of God. Grace, hey, hyper grace. I mean, there's all these people would, would try to smear the Baptist name or easy believism. Hey, God provided grace to me. I'm thankful for it. I don't deserve it. You know, a grace period. If your cell phone bill is due on the first, but they gave you the fifth to pay it, that's a grace period. You don't deserve it. You're being given it. So that's a great thing. I love grace. Grace essentially means gift. But when a Calvinist says grace, they mean something different. In the same way that a Catholic means something different when they say baptism, we may be using the same word, but we're talking about two totally different things. Yeah. It's important to understand how they misunderstand grace. And essentially, if you're instructed in Calvinism, or the doctrines of grace, that God is sovereign, which means He picked you, there's nothing you could do about it, then you believe John Calvin for salvation. You believe what John Calvin taught about salvation, you end up putting your faith in Calvinism rather than the simplicity of the gospel. And they tell you, hey, you might be elect. You might be special. And it really does appeal to the pride of human beings. Well, you know, God only picks special people and you might be one of them. Well, how come there's nobody that adamantly believes in Calvinism that would, dis that would say, well, I know God picks people and I'm not one of them. And I'm spreading the doctrines of Calvinism, but I'm not one of them. I'm the one he picked to burn. Like, well, you know, it would be kind of convoluted it would be very you know but but hey the devil wants to get you through your pride that's the easiest method and most calvinists will give faith lip service most calvinists would say you can't work your way to heaven they would it's all by faith it's all by grace you can't but they would also say you can't just pray either they would teach they mock us for teaching the gospel and showing in the Bible that it says you can call on the Lord for salvation, they mock at that. Well, you can't just make a decision to be saved. You're, you're not savable by yourself. They also believe that you must, and this is the strange part, and I'm going I'm to break it down very simple, but they also must believe that you must endure sinless to the end. I want you to think about how backwards this is for a second. Let's pretend, Brother Alex, you're a Calvinist. You've been educated in a school. They told you God loves special people only and He hates everybody else. And you say, well, yeah, I want to be special. I'm, I'm one of them. I'm one of the elite, right? But then they say, for us to know for sure that you're one of these special people, it would be evidenced by your work if you endure to the end of your life sinless. And this is why you have many mainstream, huge, popular preachers saying you can't be carnal and be a Christian. You can't still sin and be a saint. Well, I'm sorry, we're all going to sin. Until the day we die, we all probably sin every single day. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And that's what a lot of Calvinists have done. They stand up, well, I live, I'm pretty good, you know. But if I don't endure to the end, well, now wait a minute. If you're picked, then it doesn't matter. Wouldn't you think? But, but it's, it's very strange doctrine. And this is the fruit of following a man rather than Jesus Christ. Now, like I said, they teach... Tulip. They reduce it to this phrase, tulip. And the T stands for total depravity. Now, to be depraved means you're an evil, wicked person. In fact, you're so wicked, you can't, you can't be saved. And they'll use this to say that you can't call on the Lord. You can't ask for salvation. You can't even understand that you need a Savior because you're so depraved. And in Romans 5, where you're at, you know, they say you're, you're too wicked to believe Therefore, God gives you the faith. This is one of the, the fundamentals of Calvinism, is that it's not your faith. God gives you the faith. 
And I would, you know, God just reaches in and puts some faith in your heart. Before that, you didn't believe in anything. But yet, they want you to believe Calvinism. And they say you can't believe the Gospel. Look at Romans 5, verse number 6. It says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, but peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So listen, when they say we're too depraved to be saved, hey, yes, we're depraved, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. It says that He died for the ungodly in verse 6. Now, in your own mind, please don't speak up. In your own mind, think of something that you do that's ungodly. We all do things that are ungodly. Think of it. Now, God died for you knowing that you do that thing. God still loves you. God still sacrificed for you. God still paid for that sin. But it's your choice whether or not you'll be saved. The next thing they teach is unconditional election. Unconditioned means there's no condition. And election means you're saved. So what they're saying is when God picks you, there's nothing, no pre-requirement. There's nothing to do. God just chose you. But look at verse number 1. Romans 5, verse number 1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The Bible's clear here. We're justified, we're saved through our own faith, through what we believe. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Amen. It's very simple, but they, they change it. They say it's, it's unconditional. But the Bible says there is a condition. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, keeping your finger here. And you think about it, there's one thing that we absolutely positively must do to be able to go to heaven. Right? Wrote Acts 16, and they brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. You can't just say... I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. You have to believe in your heart. There are people that claim to be a child of God that don't believe that Jesus was God. They don't believe He died for their sins. They're not trusting in His work. They're trusting in their own. Or they're trusting in their confession of saying, I told you I'm a Christian. That means nothing. Even worse when it's the doctrines of men. In Ephesians 2, many of you use this out soul winning. Verse 8, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, a Calvinist will look at this verse, and where it says, it is the gift, they don't see the grace, that gift, that grace period. They see the faith. The faith is the gift of God. God chose to put faith in your heart. Before that, you had no faith. They don't understand simple English. Plain and simple, right? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can find it all throughout the Bible. The gift is something... God gives us its grace. We don't deserve it. If we believe that, if we're willing to humble ourselves and trust on the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved. Right. Our soul will be sealed unto the day of redemption. Right. Look what he says in verse 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And Calvinists are very boastful people. Yeah. Because, you, I mean, how much more to get your pride that, well, God picked me. God is a respecter of persons, and He loves me, but not you. Unless you believe John Calvin, then He might love you too. I mean, it's really strange how they try to convince people of Calvinism, but not of the Gospel. They would argue with you, you're wasting your time evangelizing. And there are some Calvinists that evangelize, but their evangelism turns into street preaching, saying, turn or burn. Turn from your sin and God might accept you. Well, hey, that's works. That's not by faith. Now look at verse 10. For we, preaching to the saved, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now that you're saved, you're eternally secure, now you ought to obey God. Now you really should start to obey His commandments. You should do these good works. If you don't, you will be corrected on the earth. But Calvinists don't understand that because the Calvinist leaders make it very difficult. They want to blind them. Now go back to Romans chapter 5. The next in tulip would be the L, where they teach limited atonement. Limit means 
Not for everybody. Atonement means salvation or payment for sins. And they literally teach Jesus didn't die for everybody, just the people he likes. And that's very sad. Yeah. Yeah. Salvation has been offered to everyone. Those that reject it, that's their choice. Right, right. Those that want to become a son of the devil, that's their choice. And they look at, well, they, the, Calvinists would believe a reprobate doctrine, but they would believe that God picked from the beginning who would be reprobate. Now, God foreknows, God foresees your choices. That doesn't mean He made the choice for you. Yeah. He gave you free will. Even the angels have free will. Even the angels chose to rebel. Lucifer chose to get full of pride and rebel against God. It was his own choice. God didn't make him for that. God made him for glory, for God's own glory. And Lucifer looked at himself in the mirror. Right? Yeah. Look, you're in Romans 5. Look at verse number 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, this is talking about Adam, right? In Adam's sin, he offended, he sinned. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Adam sinned, death entered into the world. Adam taught sin to his children. It's in the flesh. Look, he says, judgment came upon all to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification. Now notice it says free gift, but notice it says all men. Amen. And Calvinist scoff, oh, all doesn't mean all. You've got to be kidding me. Free doesn't mean free. Again, are, are you serious? Look, we give out free New Testaments. And I'll, I'll usually joke, that'll be $2. <laughs> it says free gift on it, right? I use it as an example at the door. And you think about it. I, I had a guy that... I believe he was saved, but he argued that asking for salvation, calling on the Lord is a work. And I asked him, I said, well, what if you bought Christmas presents for your children and they come in and ask you on Christmas morning, Daddy, can we open our gifts? When they ask for it, did they pay for them? No. Well, no, that's foolish. Well, yeah, what you're saying is foolish. Right. Look, salvation's a free gift. Right. God gives us a free gift. We give these out for free. Everything in this church is free. And we use it as an illustration. If I offer you the Bible for free, but then I say, I need you to give me $2, is it really free? No. no. A gift is always free. A present is always free. Salvation is free. If I say, well, don't give me any money, but I need you to mow my lawn. Is it free? No. Why not? You're working for it. You can't work for something that's free. That's wages. And Calvinists... Again, they, they mess everything up. Jesus didn't die for everybody. It's not a free gift. This verse clearly just squashes that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you find somebody that's hung up on it, Romans 5 is a good place to take them. If you find somebody that's Southern Baptist that are hung up on works, take them to Romans 4. Romans 9 also squashes a lot of Calvinism. The very verses most Calvinists put their anchor to will actually destroy their doctrine if you take it in context. Right. The next point that they have in Tulip is the eye irresistible grace. Now the Bible says they do always resist the Holy, Holy Ghost, right? Yeah. Grace is free. It's a gift. You can't say no. God picked you. There's no going back. But yet they also teach that you have to endure to the end. So wait a minute. Can you endure or not? And that's why they say their evidence of salvation is works. Look at Romans 5, verse 8. But God commended His, commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Listen to this. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received atonement. Atonement deals with your sin. He's saying while you were an enemy, God died for you. You think about it. This is a free gift. Even if you don't like me, I'll give you a free Bible. I had a lady come to our door one night here. Oh, I hear y'all doing the church thing down here. Oh, here, here's a card. Here's another card. Here's a DVD. Hey, here's a Bible. Good, I need a Bible. Great. Then she goes, wait, y'all do the Jesus thing? Uh, yeah, we do the Jesus thing, right? <laughs> We believe Jesus is His name. He is God. We don't scoff or mock at it. And then she starts telling me how she's a pastor too and her daddy's a pastor. And our, okay, get out of here. I didn't take the Bible back. 
Because I gave it to her for free. Hey, she was my enemy. I gave her a free gift, right? While you were still in unbelief, God said, I'll die for your sin. It's a free gift. Do you want it? Now, if you walk out of here and say, I don't want that Bible, it's still free. You can't change that. And they say, well, it's irresistible. No, it's a choice. You have to choose to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The last point they have in TULIP is the P. It's the perseverance of the saints. You have to persevere. You have to keep trying. You must endure to the end. They literally teach you have to keep trying to live a sinless life to be saved as proof that you're really one of the elect. And that's why most Calvinists, if they're four point, five point, they're going to tell you they don't sin anymore. They would tell you, oh, I used to, but not anymore. Really? There's no sins of the heart. There's no sins of the mind. No, the secret sins that the Bible talks about. How about lying? That's a sin, right? No, I don't sin. Liar. You know? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> I actually had a lady tell me that one time out soul winning. Nope, I've never lied. Okay. Then I saw her a year later and she was, of course, everybody lies. Oh, I remember you. You don't remember me, but you, told, you lied to me. <laughs> Calvinists would lie about that. Look at verse 17 here. It says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace, listen, and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. What's the gift here? Righteousness. Now there are none righteous, no, not one. Right? In fact, turn to Romans 3. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at just the basic salvation plan because they have to understand this just as much as a Catholic or anybody else. The gift that God gives us is righteousness in your soul. Now, is it your body that goes to heaven or your soul? soul. Your soul. Will your flesh ever be completely righteous on this earth? No. But that's what Calvinism looks for as evidence of being elect. Talk about putting a big burden on somebody. Hey, guess what? Do you believe John Calvin? You might be special. Yeah, I'm special? Cool. Now stop sinning. <laughs> I can't. Well, well, then maybe you're not one of us. Oh, no, no, I'm one of you. You see, you see the mind control that you yeah. could get in one of these places? You know, because it's all very heady. Like I said, it's all about where they went to theological seminary and using big words that most people look just scratch their head and say, okay, well, that guy uses a big word. Maybe he knows and I don't. But we need to ignore their big words. You can study them out if you want. But really, it's a bunch of foolishness. They don't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. They believe the doctrines of John Calvin. Two totally different things. And listen, the basic salvation plan, we all deserve hell. Even the elect. They don't believe that. They have to understand that. Somebody that's... I've had people that would agree with certain verses and then you get to the end of your salvation plan and you say, well, do you believe you deserve hell? Well, not me. Whoa! Where did this come from? Well, it's because I'm, I'm special. Don't you know God picked me? <laughs> you know? And you think about that mentality. The elect don't deserve hell in their mind. They'll say that. But we all deserve hell. And those that are elect, according to the Bible, elect are those that have called upon God, according to Romans 9. They've asked God to save them. That makes you elect. In Romans 3, where you're at, look at verse number 10. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now God gives us that gift of righteousness. He looks down, He says, your soul is unrighteous, you need a Savior. This is the beginning of the Gospel presentation. Verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God expects perfection. We're down here. You go to school, 100% is the best grade you can get. Right? We're probably at like 40%. Right? But even if you get 99, is that perfect? No, no it's not. It's not good enough to get to heaven. Right. Romans 6, verse 23. He starts out, The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Wages are something you earn. I get paid a wage. That's what I've earned. Because I've sinned, sin is to break God's law, I deserve death. Turn to Revelation 20. The death that it talks about is not just of my body. The death that it speaks of is of my soul as well. Verse 14, Revelation 20, 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And when you're talking to somebody and you're preaching the gospel and you show them this verse, I like to reiterate, I like to ask questions. Now, according to the Bible, what is the punishment for your sin? And most people will still say, death. And I'll show them, I show them the verse, and hell. Death and hell. The Bible says that we deserve to die and go to hell because we've broken God's law. We have earned that. 
We have earned our place in hell. Revelation 21.8, it's an example of those that deserve hell. It says the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, and murderers. Now, how many people have you murdered this year, Alex? None? Well, oh, it's a new year. Okay. How many last year? <laughs> Zero. Zero. Oh, that's good. Right. But he also says whoremongers. That's people that sleep around that are not married. And sorcerers. That's witchcraft. Harry Potter. God hates that. He says idolaters and all liars. Uh-oh. You ever told a lie? Is there anybody in here that would say you haven't lied? We'll get you right now. <laughs> he says, And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. According to the Bible, even if you've only lied, if you're not willing to be honest with yourself and look at your other sins, you have to admit you're a liar. And if you've lied, you've earned your place in hell. Go to Acts 16. We've all earned death in hell. If you won't admit that, then you cannot possibly acknowledge that you need a Savior. You're not willing to humble yourself and acknowledge that God is a righteous judge. <coughs> We've all earned hell, but you don't think God wants you to go there, do you? No, of course not. God loves you. But not everybody gets to go to heaven either, do they? And so the question is, what's the difference? What do you have to do? Now, salvation is free to all that believe on Jesus Christ as their Savior and God. This is very important. Some people do not include this in their soul winning presentation, and I think it's essential. If you do not believe that Jesus is God, then I, I would say you're not saved. Yeah. Only God can forgive sin. This is clear. Right. Only God can raise the dead, right. right? So if you're putting your trust in a man that you don't think is God, he was just a good prophet. He was just the son, most people would say. I hear, do you think Jesus is God? No, he's just the son. Well, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. Most people are confused. He is the son of God. But by being the Son of God, when He told them that, they picked up stones to kill Him because He made Himself equal with God. Now, in Romans 6.23 where He says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God wants to give you a gift. Jesus paid for it. Right? The, the church paid for these. You go out and give the gift. Right? God wants to give you a gift. It's eternal life. And I usually ask people, how long do you think everlasting life lasts for? Forever. forever. You gave them the first word of the answer, forever. If you don't believe eternal really lasts forever, then you need to fix that. Does it last a hundred years? Or stop? Well, no. It's a million years? Well, no. Well, does it last until you sin again? As a Calvinist would teach. Oh, well, no. It doesn't. It's either forever or it's not. You have to understand that salvation is everlasting. And... The wages that we earn is the opposite of the gift. When you use Romans 6, the, the wages of sin is death. Sin is to break God's law. The death it refers to is death and hell, right? You have earned hell, but the opposite side is the free gift. You didn't earn it, and it's totally free. They both last forever. And, you know, I use an example a lot of times. I'll say, well, if, if I asked you for $20, and you said, okay, here you go but I need you to mow my lawn. That would be a wage. Yeah. I would have to mow your lawn to get the $20. Then it would be mine, right? Well, that's where, that's where we stand with God as far as our sin. But as, as far as salvation, if I said, hey man, I need $20, and you just said, here you go, no strings attached, would that be a free gift? Yeah. Absolutely. And that's salvation. God's just saying, here you go, no strings attached. All you have to do is believe I'm giving it to you and it's yours. If I wrote you a million dollar check and you didn't believe me, you'd never take it out of my hand. Or maybe you'd never put it in the bank, right? And that's, as a Christian, that's what you're doing with faith. It's like faith is your spiritual currency, so to speak. And I don't usually use that as an illustration. I'm just connecting some dots. Now, so the opposite of wages is that free gift. You're in Acts 16. The one thing that you absolutely positively must do to be able to go to heaven, Acts 16.30, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, does it say, work your way to heaven? No. Does it say, believe in John Calvin? No. Does it say, understand that God picked you to go to heaven? No. no, by saying believe, it means you have to put your trust. So the question is, what do you trust in? And this is where you would take them to John chapter 3. Go ahead and go to John 3. There's two words 
that I want you to remember as you preach the gospel. Everlasting gift. Most people that think they're a Christian are messed up on one, on one of those. The everlasting gift. They either they, they don't think it lasts forever, they think there's something they could do to lose it, or they think there's something they have to do to earn it. A gift is always free and everlasting always lasts. But in your mind, if you well, if I go rob a bank and I don't have a chance to say I'm sorry, then you're trusting in your own ability to repent. Right. You're trusting in your repentance of sins to get you to heaven. That means it's not an everlasting gift. You lose it every day in your mind. Some people probably are constrained like, oh man, I, I did this, but I'm, I'm going to church. And they're back and forth and they're not settled because they're not trusting on Jesus Christ alone. Right. And like I said, everlasting gift. Remember those two things. If you hammer those points throughout your entire presentation. You know, sometimes as you're talking to people, because soul winning should not just be a script. Preaching the gospel should be a dialogue. Okay? You're not just talking to a wall. You're having a conversation. You're asking questions. You want to know where they're at. And if in the dialogue you get off base and you forget where you're at, hey, go back to the everlasting gift. Because you can't go wrong with that. It's the two most essential parts of salvation. Because the gift is everlasting life. It lasts forever. You can go back to Jesus if you forget where you're at. So remember those things. In John 3.16, he says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now this is the point in your soul winning presentation to explain about Jesus, about His life, His death, and His resurrection. Explain that He was born of God. That he was born from the Holy Spirit. That Mary was a virgin. That he lived sinless. He was tempted in all points like as we are, but yet without sin. And at the age of 30, he began his ministry. He preached the gospel. He healed the lame, right? He rose the dead. He forgave sins. He did all these things. And the religious crowd, the Jews, hated him. They put him to death. He didn't deserve it. Now, Jesus said that greater, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus could have snapped his fingers and brought down 10,000 angels to kick some butt. Oh, you're going to put me on a cross, are you? I'm going to call some angels down, right? Jesus loved us enough to lay down his life. That's what's being taught in John 3.16. And this is where you really want to teach who Jesus was. You want to find out what they know. A lot of times you can start by asking, what do you know about Jesus? And some people have bits and pieces. But it's very important to make sure that they believe that he rose from the dead. And you very, very important to believe that he is God. This is where I'll ask, do you believe Jesus is God? And the majority of the people would say, well, he's the son of God. Which means they're not, you know, there are Christians that don't believe Jesus is God. That means they're Christian in name only. They need to get saved. They need to put their trust in Jesus as God and Savior. It's a package deal. If you miss that, if you leave that detail out, you may be leave, leaving people hanging. There may be people that tell you it's all by faith, I believe in Jesus, but in their heart, they don't think He's God. They don't put Him up here with the God that can save their soul. So what are they really saved from? It's like God opened the door, now I have to work my way through. It's sad. It's difficult. It's impossible. And that's why we ask questions and try to help people. Like I said, this is where you make sure they believe in the resurrection because if I died and came back and I told you it was going to happen, you'd start paying attention to what I have to say, right? Um, also, when we read earlier, when I told you about how death and hell were cast in the lake of fire, I, I hammer the death and the hell. Because everybody said, well, Jesus died for my sins. And that's, they've heard that phrase, but they don't always know what it means. Why did he die? Because I'm a sinner. Well, when Jesus died, right, they put him on the cross. First they whipped him, they beat him. They put a bag over his head and said, if you're God, tell us who hit you. I'm not mocking your creator, right? It says in Isaiah that they plucked his beard out of his face. And again, he could have stopped it at any moment. But he loved us and he chose to suffer for us. And through the process, he died, right? He died on the cross. He literally physically had nails through his hands, through his feet. They took his body down. They put him in the tomb. You ask people, what happened three days later? And this is very important because here lately I'm finding a lot of Catholics that would say he disappeared. It's like, well, that sounds like a Jehovah's Witness. But I'm hearing a lot of Catholics that would say that. Well, he disappeared. Well, what does that mean? What do you mean he disappeared? They don't understand the resurrection. They're not being taught 
the essence of the resurrection, the meaning of the resurrection, the doctrine that they're receiving is being watered down. So it's important to make sure they understand that He died and rose again and that they actually believe that. Not just believe that Jesus existed, but trust that they understand that He came back from the dead, conquering death and hell for us. And the death and hell part, I ask him, well, where, did he, where do you think His soul went for those three days? Most people will say, well, to heaven. Well, sure, He was perfect, right? He deserves heaven. But why did, he die for, why did He die again? Well, for my sin. And what was the punishment for your sin? Death and... Oh, death and hell. So if the punishment for my sin is death and hell, and Jesus said, I'm going to pay for all your sins, He died and went to hell. And I'll tell them just like that, and then I show them Acts 2.31, or I'll quote it to them. He's saying this before. Spake of the resurrection of Christ, that His soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. And I do think that helps a lot of people where kind of the light bulb comes on. Like, wow, I know I deserve hell and Jesus died for me. But then they see the full picture. He died and went to hell so I don't have to go. Right. It's a very important part. And there are a lot of Calvinists out there that mock that, just saying that Jesus went to hell. They mock the blood. And so it's important to kind of get these doctrines out there and ask questions to find out where people stand. In John 3.18, it says, He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, if you believe, you're not condemned for your sin. And if not, and this is a good place to ask somebody, so if you don't believe Jesus is God, where are you going to go when you die? Now, you can ask if you don't believe Jesus died for your sins, but I, I like to just double check on whether or not they believe Jesus is God. And I find this is a good verse for that. <clears throat> verse 36 in the same chapter. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Flip ahead to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Verse number 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, hey, that's you, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life. That's have it right now. That's present tense. At the moment you believe, you have it. Hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Without Jesus Christ, without believing that he's God, without trusting in him for salvation, you're on your way to death but then you're passed unto life. It says you're passed from death unto life, and all that you have to do according to this verse is hear the Word and believe. Another just solid verse. There's so many verses in John. You could spend an hour just reading verses. John's such a good book. And there's a few key ones that I like to take people to. Again, everlasting gift. How do you get it? By trusting, by believing, by having faith. Flip ahead to John chapter 6, verse 40. John chapter 6, verse number 40. And this is the will of Him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life. And I will raise Him up at the last day. The will of the Father is that we would believe on the Son. The will of the Father is not that you would try to work your way to heaven, as a lot of people falsely teach. John 6, 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on Me hath everlasting life. What a bold statement by Jesus. And if He was not God, then who was He to be able to say, you can live forever. Your soul will live forever if you believe on Me. Right. You think about how, how you take... I mean, yes, I know the Bible teaches He's the Son of Man. And He's the Son of God. The Bible also teaches He is God. And you have to understand how all this comes together because those that get stuck on one phrase and they leave out the other doctrine... There's a lot of verses that just wouldn't make sense to them. So it's important to drive these home and lay this foundation. John chapter 10. Look at John chapter 10. And I give unto them, verse 28, I'm sorry, John 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now listen, if I have to endure sinless to the end, then what, how could God say He's got a hold of my soul? How could he say that you can't pluck yourself? No man. Hey, are you a man? You can't pluck yourself out. 
Somebody else can't come and steal me away from God because God has me. So how is it that a Calvinist can teach you have to stay preserved? It's up to you. It's foolishness. Look at verse 29. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. In the mind of a Calvinist, the writings of John Calvin are greater than the Father, hey, than the Son, the Savior, which is God. They have elevated the writings of a man over the simplicity of the Gospel. John chapter 11, last place we'll go here. John chapter 11, look at verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life, and he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Verse 25 here, Jesus is telling her, I'm the resurrection. I am the life. I am everlasting life. Only God can make this claim. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Again, another verse that would really just squash all the points of Calvinism. Do you believe that? It's up to you to believe it. Jesus called her out on the carpet. Do you really believe that? If so, you can be saved. But Calvinists would teach the opposite. And I would ask him, do you believe John Calvin over Jesus Christ? Because I just quoted a bunch of verses from Jesus that make it clear, it's up to you what you choose. It's up to you what you believe. And if you don't believe, you're going to hell. And that's where many Calvinists will end up, sadly. And when you, when you run across them, we still preach in the Gospel just as much as a Catholic has to give up if they think that the Pope is somehow Jesus on earth. They have to give that up. And they have to believe that Jesus is separate and Jesus is God. They have to give up their old beliefs and believe only on the Lord. In the same way, a Calvinist has to be willing to give up John Calvin and willing to change their mind about the Gospel. Now listen, salvation does not mean you're going to have all doctrines figured out 100%. That doesn't mean you're always going to be right, but it really is a heart issue on what you want to believe in. It's up to us. The Bible tells us to choose, a, choose you this day whom you will serve. That goes against Tulip. Your faith alone saves you. He died for everyone. That goes against Tulip. The Bible also warned that they do always resist the Holy Ghost. There are those that resist God and resist God. They harden their neck. They harden their heart. You know what? Turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. We're going to read one more thing. It's impossible for anybody to endure sinless. We are not capable of doing it. Neither is a Calvinist, even if they lie to themselves and deceive themselves. Calvinism is a false gospel. And if you work to the end and you're special, God might accept you. Man, that's impossible. God loves you in your imperfect state and He wants you to put your trust on Him and Him alone. Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 26. And He said, So is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed onto the ground. Right? We know the seed is the Word of God. And Jesus has given him an example. Hey, what's the kingdom like? It's like a guy just going around throwing seed. And in this passage, He tells us about, well, some seed went to the stones and the briars and all these other things, right? We, but He just threw the seed everywhere. Think of this as a soul winner. Verse 26, and he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring up and grow up, he knoweth not how. Sometimes we, we talk to people that later in life we had planted a seed and we didn't even know it. We don't know how it grows in a man's heart. There are men that may even say they believe and later... It's gone. They didn't really believe. They were lying. They were deceiving. So we don't always understand how it develops in a man's heart. But we are responsible to just throw that seed out. Keep throwing that seed. That's our job. Look, he says, verse 28, For the earth bringeth forth the fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn of the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in a sickle, because the harvest is come. God's goal is that we just throw seed and throw seed. We preach the Word. We preach the Word. Oh, there's some fruit. Hey, there's some fruit. That's the goal. We preach to everybody. Calvinism would have you to believe that you know it's, it's, not, it's not worth your time to preach the Gospel. And listen, preaching the Gospel is a sacrifice of time, but God sees it as precious and valuable 
and necessary. He commands us to go do it. Yeah. And we're just going to throw that seed out to everybody that will listen. Even if you think they're a reprobate to begin with, hey, try preaching to them. You don't know. Don't judge a book by its cover. And Calvin, Calvinism would argue against missionaries or evangelism, but that's why we reject Calvinism as a whole. We reject Arminianism that would say you work your way to heaven. We believe the gospel. We believe in the power of the gospel. And I just want to empower you and help you be able to teach Calvinists that what they trust in is a man and not the word of God. If they would humble themselves and say, well, I don't know everything and I want to know, they can be saved. And that's why we go preaching. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the word. Lord, thank you for the free gift that lasts forever. Lord, I'm thankful that I don't have to endure sinless to receive it. Lord, otherwise nobody would be saved. Nobody would be in heaven. We know that you loved us enough to suffer for us and even burn for us. Lord, we thank you and help us to just stay humble and be willing to go out and preach. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. In closing, let's take our hymnals and turn to page 174. Page 174. My Jesus, I love thee. 